Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth of the 13 webinars that are part of the 2020 EMOS webinars program. My name is Caterina Giusti. I'm professor of statistics at the University of Pisa in Italy, and today I will act as the webinar facilitator. As this is a live event, I would like to specify that today I connected from my house, as all the other members of the EMOS staff at the University of Pisa, as our speakers, I know, and I guess also as many of you. Of course, it is fundamental that we all follow the direction of our governments and organization. For the EMOS events, we are lucky since webinars are indeed a powerful tool that we can continue to use also in these difficult times. So going back to our webinar, let me first explain for any newcomers that EMOS stands for the European Master in Official Statistics, a joint project of university and data producers in the EU member states, EFTA, and EU candidate countries. If your university is interested in applying for the EMOS label, please consider that the permanently open call for university is available on the EMOS dedicated page on Eurostat website. For staying in contact with the EMOS news and community, please follow the EMOS on Twitter. The EMOS account is at EU underscore EMOS. Now, before I give the floor to our speaker, let me briefly explain how we run the webinar today. As a participant, you can watch and listen to the session. To interact with the presenter, you can use the chat represented by the comic symbol. We encourage you to prepare your questions and post them during the presentation or the question break. We will have some question breaks and a final discussion to replay to the question. Should you have any technical problem, please try restarting the Skype for business or the computer or device that you are using. For more specific technical questions, you can use the chat and you will receive a personal reply. In any case, please consider that the slides of the presentation are already available on the EMOS 2020 events website. So today, I have the great pleasure to host Dr. Mark van der Roo from Statistics Netherlands. So Mark is a researcher in Statistics Netherlands with a broad interest in statistical computing. Over the last years, he published several popular R packages and papers in the area of data cleaning that are used in the production at Statistics Netherlands and elsewhere. In 2018, he, Edwin de Dons, published a book entitled Statistical Data Cleaning with Application in R, we join Wilde and Sons, and together with Olaf Den Bosch, he founded a popular awesome list of open source software for, statist for official statistics in 2017. You can see awesomeofficialstatistics.org for more details. Today, he will present about her, Python, and Julia. Do you know them all? So, Mark, the floor now is yours until the first question break. Uh, thank you. Katarina, and uh, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, I must say it's a, it's a pleasure to do a webinar. It's my first one, so uh, I'm excited about it, and it's a bit uh, strange to be talking to my screen. Um, and another reason I was excited uh, to, to give this gave me a really nice uh, opportunity to dive into especially uh, Julia and Python uh, again. I'm, a, I'm an uh, avid R user myself. I've been using Python as well. And I've been following Julia since its uh, inception about uh, 10 years ago, but this gave me an opportunity to really uh, dive in a little bit again. Uh, this talk uh, will really be a kind of a high level overview. I mean, all systems are, are huge systems with a lot of uh, users and, and libraries and different applications. So I just hope to give you a flavor of uh, what these three languages are, are good at and what the, sort of their core uh, properties are. So I'm going to slide two now for the people who cannot see the slides. Um, so we have three sort of uh, sub-sessions. I'm going to start talking a, bit, a little bit about where these languages uh, come from, uh, what their typical uh, use cases are. Um, in the second part, and then there's a question break, and then in the second part, I'll talk, talk about how these languages can be extended, and that you will see there are some uh, important differences there. And in the third part, I focus on uh, the, the main functionality that's most important for us as official statisticians, and let's look into some properties that have to do with data analysis. 
So before uh, all that, let's take uh, one step back and think a little bit about what um, Julia and Python and R, what they actually are. Um, well, in short, they, they are uh, programming languages. And uh, from a very, uh, let's say, from a very, viewed from a very long distance, you can distinguish between um, one type you see on the left here, uh, and by the way, I'm on slide three now, um, is compiled languages. So that's where you, as a user, would uh, just write a text file with your program. For example, print hello world. You store that file somewhere, you feed that file to another program called a compiler. And the compiler then creates for you a standalone program, for example, hello.exe. So in order to get anything useful out of your code, out of your, um, out of your software, you would have to run hello.exe. Um, on the other hand, on the right side here, uh, there are interpreted languages. Um, and these uh, act in a sense similar, but the difference is that instead of typing your commands and your, your you can type them into a file and then feed them to an interpreter. And what an interpreter does is it doesn't just read and understand your code, it actually also executes it. So the interpreter or the technical term for it is called a REPL, read, evaluate, print loop, uh, reads what you type, uh, tries to understand it, tries to execute it and give you the result immediately. So there are some advantages and disadvantages to this approach. Um, an advantage to this approach is, well, what I just said, you get your result immediately. It's very, it's highly interactive. Um, a disadvantage is, is that when I write something in simple, the only way for you to run it is to also install R. And similarly for Python and, and Julia. But all these, these three languages are interpreted languages. Um, whereas if you have a compiled language, I can just write my program uh, build the executable, give you the executable, and you can just run it. So there's a, some uh, like a less dependency in there, in principle. Now, um, the reality is not as, as uh, binary as I just told you. There are many different levels of graduation between being interpreted and being a compiled uh, language. Um, I would say that R is purely interpreted. There is no way that you can create a standalone executable is not at the moment. So if you want to run R code that, for example, I wrote and I give it to you, you need to install R and then you can run that code. Um, the same is true for Python, basically, except there is a third party application called Py2exe that actually can take um, a Python code and create an executable for you. Uh, but that's not part of Python itself, right? This is something that a third party uh, has developed. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you look at Julia, Julia sort of sits in the middle. I mean, normally you would use Julia uh, from the command line, from the interpreter as an interactive tool. Uh, but Julia does have a built-in option to compile it straight into an executable. So Julia combines sort of, the, in that sense, the best of both worlds. You can choose to either use it as an interpreted language, but you also have the option to compile it into an executable. So there's already some... Uh, technical differences between the, the three languages. Okay, so that, that's a very technical part of it and maybe the most technical part of my talk. Um, in the next three slides, I would just like to highlight where the three languages come from. So I'm at slide four now. Um, so let's start with R. So if you look in the description of R, it will tell you that it's a free software environment for uh, statistical computing and and graphics. So that's really at the core, every aspect of the language of R has basically been designed designed for this, with this in mind. Uh, it's focused at statisticians, uh, nowadays also heavily used, of course, uh, by data scientists. Um, and uh, one maybe uh, interesting thing to know about R is that R is not uh, invented by itself. It was really uh, a follow-up or like a re-implementation of an existing language called S that was invented at Bell Labs uh, by John Chambers and co-authors in the, in the 70s. So R has a history already of uh, 
let's say about 40 years if you date back to S, and about 25 years if you just look at R itself. Now there's a big difference with the reason that Python was created. Um, I mean, R was created sort of as, or S was created sort of as a glue between all kind of um, loose standing uh, software for uh, statistical data analysis. Uh, Python was design, designed to be a high level programming language. Uh, one of the main design purposes in Python when it was first developed in the, in the late 90s, uh, late 80s, sorry, in uh, Amsterdam at the Center for Mathematics and Computer Science. Uh, is that it should be a language that is easy to learn. So it was really uh, sort of optimized to be uh, readable and easy to program. So programmers wouldn't have to worry about things like where do I mem uh, allocate memory? Do I make sure that memory is uh, cleaned up after I use it? So that's what, amongst other things, is meant with high level. But it's really meant as a general uh, language. So uh, standard basic uh, Python without anything else attached, has no um, built-in facilities for data analysis. It's just a programming language in that sense, like any other programming language, but a very convenient and very extremely popular one at that. Then if you look at Julia, Julia sort of uh, sits in the middle here. Um, when Julia came out, uh, it first strongly reminded me a little bit of uh, the time uh, when I was doing my PhD and I did a huge amount of work in MATLAB. So it, it was developed at MIT since 2009. And what the, the, the Julia people did was basically look at a lot of the existing numerical or engineering uh, languages there like MATLAB, Scilab, Octave, uh, a lot has been available, of course, in Fortran and C++, and they try to combine the best of all worlds. Um, so the, the, the sort of uh, legend about interpreted um, languages is that they are very easy to write, very easy to create programs, but they are slow. So they really wanted to create something that is both fast and easy to use, with a very strong focus on uh, numerical computing. So whereas in, in R, the, the users are typically data scientists, analysts, um, and, and people who analyze data for, for, you know, for their own specific field. Um, in Python, you find almost everything. I mean, there's the physics and engineering community, there's the community of web development, there's multimedia development. It's extremely broad. And in Julia is focused um, in its inception, at least, uh, very specifically, I think, to uh, engineering physics. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have really nice uh, data analysis tools in there, and I will, I will show you later um, as well. So Julia is about 10 years old, uh, Python about uh, 30 years old, and R with three uh, different purposes, I would say, and designed with three different purposes. And these, uh, these different purposes have led to different design decisions that will also that become kind of the theme of this uh, talk, I would say, because they have very real uh, consequences to how a user doing data analysis, for example, experience these tools. Okay, um, so far I'm at slide seven now, by the way. Uh, thus far, I've been talking um, uh, fairly abstractly about these uh, languages, uh, but I think it's a good idea that we also take a look at the syntax so you can get a feel what it actually looks like. So in the next slide, I will give you an example. Um, the Iris dataset, that's uh, especially for R users and people who use Python Pandas, uh, famous uh, example dataset. It has 150 records. The first six you see here. Uh, there are four numerical columns and one column uh, that's a categorical variable that tells you uh, the species of iris. So what I'm going to, what I've done for the next slide is to compute the average length of the sepals for each species. So it's a very typical data analysis uh, operation, I would say, grouped aggregation. In a classifying variable, you want to summarize 
uh, some of the other variables. In this case, the sepal length. So let's have a look to get a flavor of what these uh, languages look like. So if you look at the top, and I hope everybody can see my, uh, my mouse as well. Um, in R, if you, we're going to read in the data set using uh, read.csv. And then there's a function called aggregate. You one that you want to summarize. You also give it the column that you want to use to split up the data set for summarization. And you tell it that you want a mean. So it's a it's it's really high level. You only have to specify what you want. You don't have to loop over the records. You don't have to make any filters for um, the type of species that you want. And immediately R gives you back for the three different species the, the average sepal dot length. Okay, and in, in this case, um, I only show the output in R, but the output in Python and Julia is of course exactly different, but uh, the values are the same. Now, if you look at Python, there's a uh, few differences. Uh, one is that first we need to import the library. So um, we are going to read a CSV file, but Python cannot do this natively. Uh, here we use a very popular library called Pandas. And we load it into, into Python using import and we call it PD. And then using pd.readcsv, we can read in the, the iris data set again. And then there's a little bit of difference in, uh, in syntax. Uh, rather than having an aggregate function, iris, and then a dot group by. So how, with which variable are we going to split it up? We're going to split it up by species. We choose a column and we say AGG stands for aggregate using mean. So it's again, it's really, uh, we're not doing any real programming in a sense, we're really specifying what we want. We want a grouped mean uh, of sepal length grouped by species from the iris data set. Okay, and then Julia, we need three libraries here. Uh, actually, you need two. We need a CSV and data frames library. So instead of one in Python and zero in R, we need two in Julia. We read the data set and then there's again a function it says for the iris data set, split by species and compute the mean. And uh, I think the, the Julia uh, expression here uh, most closely resembles in a way uh, the R expression. And Python stands out because it uses this dot syntax. And that's because uh, Python at its, at its core, at its inception is an object oriented language, whereas R and Julia are uh, closer to being functional uh, type languages. Now I have a slide on that. Um, it's very technical, so I'm, I think I'm going to uh, skip that for now. Um, but it is a, it's, it's kind of, if you have a sort of computer science background, it's interesting to know that Python sits closer to object orientation and R and Julia um, are closer to, uh, to functional programming. Okay. <clears throat> I am now at slide uh, 10. And before we go to the first uh, question uh, set, uh, a little bit uh, where things are in R, Python, and Julia. So, um, and especially for data analysis. So that's what I, I will focus this talk um, mostly on. So if you look, for example, uh, we, we saw that R is, has been designed from the core for data analysis. And one consequence of that is that R itself understands that data can be missing. So in R, if you, if you read in a number or if you read in a text file or if you read in categorical data or if you get data from a database, R understands if you have a column of data, sometimes this data can be missing. Um, the fact that R as a language knows this means that every library, every R package that works in R uh, handles uh, in a graceful way the fact that data can be missing. Every function, every library understands that data can be missing. And that's a, that's a big difference between how things work with, for example, Python and Julia. I mean, both Python and Julia have facilities for representing missing values, but they are implemented in libraries. 
And it's not necessarily true if one library implements a missing value that the other library knows how it works. And we're going to see some examples of how libraries do not always match up, uh, for example, and in R, this consistency is, uh, is, at least in the area of data analysis, is, uh, is higher. So similarly, um, in R, things like data frames exist. So how do you represent a columnar a re a rectangular data set? In R, this is already built in. Python and Julia, these are uh, libraries. Um, there are pros and cons there. The fact that it's built in into R means that uh, uh, it's hard to change it if, if the R uh, core developers would like to change how a data frame works from a user perspective. Uh, a lot of code would not work anymore. <laughs> um, and in Python, you might just load a different library. Right? So there's uh, there, 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 the internal consistency is, um, is for sure a pro, but the fact that you're a bit more flexible in Python and Julia can have advantages as well. Um, so this is similar for interactive graphics. This is built into R. These are libraries in Python and Julia. Uh, summary statistics, um, grouping, things like, um, like hypotheses, tests, um, linear models. This is all built into R straight from the start. And these are libraries in Julia. Uh, the only difference in big in R uh, machine learning uh, libraries are, are really libraries and not uh, natively built in. So at this point, I think it's good to pause and see if there are any questions. Yes, uh, Mark, sometimes we have some lag on your voice, but I think this is something with the connection. So I think it's still we can uh, follow your, you. So I just apologize with the uh, participants, but I think that in any case, we are not missing any so, uh, important. Uh, okay, so we, we had one uh, question about slide eight. It was about, uh, I think Julia Code should say CPAL length instead of CPAL width. And then we have, uh, uh, what is the command to compile code in Julia? Another one. Yes, the uh, command to compile oh. uh, Julia is not it's not in Julia. Well, it's it's part of the standard library in Julia. So there is a, a Julia package called compiler, and there is to compile. Uh, okay, and then we have another question. Do you think that today we can do data analysis in R and not using the tied words? Uh, I would say definitely yes. Um, I do. Um, I use the tidyverse basically for um, things that I can. Uh, I use uh, code that I use only once. So I think tidyverse. I really like it for interactive work because it's very, very fast, very consistent. Um, but one thing um, that that is a uh, uh, well. I find problematic with the tidyverse is when you bring it to production, is that they tend to change API. So, for example, there's a new version of Dplyr coming up, a very popular package within the R tidyverse, and we already know that this has some breaking changes. So, if you update your Dplyr uh, package, there's a chance that some of your code will not run anymore, or that your code will run and give different output. And that's, that kind of stability is something that base R has is much stronger in than the tidyverse. Uh, so when I write a package, I, I tend to avoid tidyverse. But when I do one-off data analysis, uh, I use tidyverse all the time. Okay, uh, and then another question: Why it is necessary to learn three of software? Well, I think it depends. <laughs> It, it depends, but I think for a, for a data scientist, it's really important to be fluent in one of them. And at the moment, Python and uh, R are the most popular ones. So I would advise somebody to become really being able to programming them almost without thinking. You know, if you want to transform or read a data set because you often data analysis 
involves you know a lot of iterations, trying things out, you know, modeling, visualization, doing some filtering, and it's really beneficial to be able to do that quickly. Um, then again, if you're very fluent in R, um, like me, for instance. Uh, there are there is some functionality that's just not available in R. So Python is much stronger in machine learning. So it's good to also know some Python when you when you need it. Uh, but for day-to-day -day work, the most important thing is to be fluent uh, in one of them. The question. So great presentation and thanks for the answer regarding tidy reverse. Julia, was the reason I didn't invest much in Python? Do you think Julia can be used as a replacement for Python when it comes for machine learning? Um, I must say, I, uh, I have, what I've seen in Julia is that there are some very interesting um, framework in machine learning. Um, I'm not sure how complete it is compared to Python. So in Python, there's a couple of really uh, uh, popular packages, especially those uh, that have been published by, by Google. Um, so I would have to make a more detailed comparison to, uh, to, to say something for sure about it. I myself am really impressed by the way that Julia is designed, uh, the speed, the, the nice way they have to find things like they, they handle types. So for technical computing, I think if, if I would start my PhD now, I would definitely choose Julia. Okay, so we have uh, a, another couple of questions that maybe I think we, we should go on. So any opinions or on workflows uh, combine, combining two or more of them, for example, reticulate, et cetera? Yeah, that, I will yeah. Uh, uh, come back to that at the end of the talk. Okay. Okay, so, okay, we have another fall in your experience. It's more easy to develop an API library in Python or in Julia? Uh, that's a good question. It, it depends uh, what you think, what, what you mean with... Um, API. Uh, ah, you mean uh, to develop a package. I will come back to that actually now in the next part of the talk. Yeah, that was my guess. And then uh, what is the easiest program to use R or Python? But I'm not sure. I would say, yeah. I would say um, for data analysis, for beginners, R is much easier. And I will show you why also in the next uh, uh, section, or in the last section, actually. It has mainly to do with the fact that data analysis uh, tools in R have, are more closely integrated than in Python. Okay, yeah, so I think we can go on. I suggest we go on okay. to the next set. Okay, thank you for uh, for your enthusiasm and all your questions, by the way. Okay, so um, in the next section, I'm going to take a look on extendability and packages, packaging systems. Uh, so all three languages have a way of extending the sort of core language with uh, user-defined libraries. So a user-defined library is typically a collection of code or functions that add new functionality to the language that uh, you don't have in the core. Now, in R, uh, these are published on, on a website called CRAN. There's about 15,000 uh, libraries available there at the moment. Uh, for Python, there are several systems, but the most popular one is uh, PyPy, the, the Python uh, package index. There's a staggering 224,000 uh, different packages there, which just goes to show how uh, general uh, R and how, and how popular Python is. And for Julia, which is of course also the youngest uh, language uh, in the block, there's something called the General uh, Julia reg Registry, and there are uh, about uh, 3,300 uh, packages on there. Now for, for, for languages, in your own repository. So for RDS Bioconductor, for Julia, I'm sure there are other registries and Python there are multiple as well. Uh, but these are the, I think, the most important ones. Um, 
the numbers differ greatly, uh, but I would also like to emphasize that, you know, the um, the numbers are not the most not, not the most uh, important. I mean, there's a huge amount of packages. I'm sure in all three. I mean, on cron alone, there are two R packages that are just written to uh, to to write uh, Chuck Norris jokes to the to the screen, for example. So uh, not everything. Uh, the, the numbers don't mean everything, right? So, um, okay, just a little bit of syntax again, just to compare uh, how these systems work from a user uh, point of view. If you want to install a package, I mean, I always compare a package with an app, like on your phone, you install it once, and after that you, you can use them. You know, you get an icon, you load them, uh, and you use them. So in R, it has a native built-in uh, built uh, package manager, and you use installed all packages with a package name. It, Grabs the package from from CRAN, uh, unpacks it in a specific live in a specific uh, folder, and from then on you can use it. And Python uh, does not have uh, a native uh, packaging system, but there's a third-party system called PIP, which is of course uh, developed closely with uh, the Python itself. Um, what you can do, for example, PIP install uh, my package. It will grab the package from PyPy. And then you start Python, or Python 3 in this case, and then you can import it. So rather than having it in, built into the language, it is uh, like a third-party program. And in Julia, again, sits a little bit in between here. It's not a third-party program. It's also not exactly in the core language. Uh, instead, you have to... Julia, called uh, PKG. Using pkg.add, you download and install, and then with the command using, you uh, you open the or you, you load the, the library. So small differences. There's also small differences when you look at um, how they are, uh, how packages are built. So I'll go uh, through uh, all three of them quickly. So if you want to build an R package as a user, uh, you start on the left. And I, I'm on slide uh, 14 now for the people who, who do not see the shared screen. Uh, you start on the left, and basically what you do is you create a directory. Uh, in that directory, there's a subdirectory with your code. It's called R. There's a subdirectory called man, where you have all the user manuals. There's a description file that has some metadata on the package, like what's the title of the package, who's the author, a description, a version number, things like that. Then there's an external uh, command that uh, you run, and it grabs all that stuff puts it into a single file, a zipped file, kind of. It's called a tarball. That's the, let's say, maybe not a technical term, but a common term for it. Um, and if you want, you can install tarball already, or you can uh, publish it on CRAN. So CRAN will, uh, after some checks, uh, if you pass some checks, um, accept the package. It will be put on the website, and then every other R user in the world with internet connectivity can, uh, can use it. Okay. I mean, you also create a directory. It has some files with uh, some metadata, um, a license file, a setup.py uh, that describes your dependencies and, and things like that. Uh, you can have a test folder that, that might be empty. But again, you set up all your code and metadata. There's a build system that packages everything in a tarball or and or into something called a wheel file. That's sort of a binary. And then you can publish it, you upload uh, those files to PyPy. And then uh, it, it will generate a sort of a web page for it. And then uh, any uh, PIP user can install it. Right? So both Chrome and, and PyPy are central repositories. There's, uh, well, everything's virtualized and in the cloud nowadays. But basically, there's, there's one computer, one hard drive where all PyPy uh, packages are, where everybody downloads them from. And there's one computer, one hard drive, where, where the cron packages are. And that's where everybody downloads them from. So there's a difference with how things work in, in, in Julia. On the left side, you start uh, very similar. You have a directory. You have a subdirectory with your source code. That's where you write all your programs. There's a, a, a tunnel file. That, that's kind of a configuration file where you have all your metadata, again, like title, dependencies, version number, things like that, and maybe some other things. But then there's a difference. Uh, rather than 
um, uploading, building, uh, and zipping all that stuff, and uploading it to a central repository, the only thing you do is you create an entry into a central registry. Uh, so Julia um, has a special uh, GitHub uh, site, uh, which is the Julia uh, General Registry, which is basically a big list of Julia packages. And every entry in the list basically says this is the title, there's a description, and then there is a URL of where you can actually download that package from and install it. So when you do package.add in Julia, it does not, uh, it will look into that uh, central registry. Does the package exist? If so, where can I find it? And then it will download it from somewhere else. Okay, so there's no uh, central repository like in Python and in, um, in R. Um, and there are some consequences to that from a, from a user point of view. So if you compare the three uh, different systems, if you look at me, we start on the top. I'm in, in slide uh, 17, uh, by the way. And CRAN has kind of three services. It's a registry, so it shows you what is available. It's hosting, so it actually uh, holds all the source code. It holds the packages and some binary versions as well on a central centralized repository. And it also performs uh, a lot of checks on that on those packages. And I will come back to that uh, in the next slide. If you look at uh, PyPy, it's a registry. You can find all the, the, it makes it findable, right? You, you, uh, you're discoverable, let's say, what packages are there. It also hosts uh, the code, so there's a central place to download it from. So the registry doesn't only make it discoverable, it also guarantees that um, you can discover it, but it's also available because it's available in that central so you can download it, but it performs no checking, except maybe a little bit of uh, basic checks on metadata. Uh, for example, that there are no collisions in uh, double uh, like packages with the same name. And if you look at Julia, it does even less. Uh, so there is, a gen uh, there is a, a registry, but that's only a list. It's just a list of this is the name of the package. That's where you can find it. It doesn't host packages, so there's a registry that points to a place on GitHub, uh, but that means there can be, in principle, mismatches between what is in the registry and what is actually hosted on GitHub somewhere else. And it, uh, as a consequence, of course, it also doesn't perform any checking on uh, uh, whatever is in the, in the registry, except, again, uh, that it's a valid registry entry, so that it fits inside the registry. Uh, so you see, uh, there are different levels of services that you have um, between these uh, different repository systems. Um, and I think one of the uh, most important differences that sets R apart from Python and Julia is the amount of checks that happen on CRAN. So I want to uh, spend one slide, slide number 18, uh, on what is actually checked uh, by CRAN. So if you author an R package, and the first time you think I'm ready and I want to publish it, the first time you send it to CRAN, it is actually uh, first, or one of the checks that happens, it's that the team that actually opens your files, reads the description, sees if the description is clear enough, if it's uh, written in a certain uh, style, so there's a consistency in style across packages. Um, they also dig a little bit into the code to see if, there, if there's any intellectual property rights uh, violation. Um, I will give you one example from, from my own experience. Uh, I, I copied some code, uh, some, some C code, a, a hashing uh, function, and I did mention the author of that code in the source code, but I forgot, I just forgot uh, putting them into the author list. This person to the author list as well. Uh, so there's quite extensive checking there, uh, checking there, and also, um, and this is actually true for Julia and Python as, as well. But there are no anonymous packages allowed. I mean, they really want you to use a personal email address, and they prefer not to have, for example, institutional email addresses. So you need to be able to publish. You need a working email address, um, preferably that is uh, from from a person and not a department or institution. So besides those human checks, 
Uh, there are automated checks that are done on first publication, but also on all updates. So just to mention some of the things that they check, uh, like package integrity, does, does all the R code actually run? Is it valid R code? Is all the R code that's exposed to the user, has that been documented? So you have a minimal level of uh, guarantee and uh, documentation. If you have examples in your documentation, these are all run. If any of them crashes, the package is not accepted. If you have unit tests, all of those are run. Uh, all packages are tested on, I think, 12 different platforms. And one of the most um, impressive things that they do on CRAN is cross-package integrity. And that means that if I write a package called A, and that uses functionality from another package called B, um, and package B gets updated, then my package is first checked again against the new version of B. So the person that wants to publish B uh, has to make sure that my package is not uh, crashing because of updates in the package B. So the 15,000 packages on CRAN are checked with respect to one another, with respect to dependency and what's called reverse dependencies as a kind of network, uh, continuously at each update. And this gives an extremely high level of consistency between uh, packages that is absolutely not uh, available in, uh, uh, not guaranteed at least in, uh, in Julia or Python. And that, that, there are consequences for users uh, to that. Can come back to in the final part, uh, but let's first see if there are any questions. Okay, so again, you, okay, we have one, the popularity of Python is increasing in data science each year according to the open jobs and users. How do you see the future of R and an existing presence of Julia in higher education classes in the light of this rise? Yeah, that's, that's true. I think the popularity of, of Python um, in data science is largely due to the fact that uh, a couple of big companies like Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, uh, no, especially Google and Facebook, I think, have been publishing uh, strong machine learning libraries in Python. So that's, and, and of course, machine learning is still sort of on the top of the, of the hype cycle, right? Um, so it, it, that, I think that, is, it's, I don't have hard figures for that, but, but I think that has been the, the main driver, uh, one of the main drivers. Another one is that Python is already known uh, with computer scientists and, and let's say the IT departments for a very long time. So it was naturally easier to integrate probably with, with existing business uh, software than R. On the other hand, I think, I don't think R is going anywhere very soon because if you see at, look at the amount of um, applications that are available in R, um, I mean, in, in, and I will come back to this also in the final part of the talk, but in uh, R, for instance, or let's say in Python, you have very strong machine learning library, but it doesn't give you an application. For example, if you want to do small area estimation and you want to use some kind of machine learning algorithm in the background, um, you still have to write that small area estimation library yourself, right? You cannot specify a small area estimation problem in Python. You can do that in R. So, R is closer to many of, I would say, data analysis applications, closer to the user in that sense than Python. And that's also why I think R is a, is a, is a bit easier to learn, especially for beginners. So where, where are they going? Um, hard to tell. Um, I think none of them uh, will disappear. Um, and I think the future is uh, closer integration. That's something I will also come back to. So we have another question. R Rupen, she does package review and they have really great process. Do you think having similar process for software built for official statistics can be done? Is there any meta organization like uh, our open SI for official stats? Well, there's an attempt. The, the famous attempt uh, in the European statistical system is um, 
an implementation of something called the common statistical production architecture. And the idea there is to have a sort of a catalog of approved software. And until now, the, this, this has started this somewhere around 2010, 11. Until now, um, a lot of standards have been and documents have been produced that says what, uh, what we have to describe in the software, how that documentation should look like, how the catalog should look like. Um, there is a catalog as well. Uh, but it's almost empty. I mean, there are maybe a maximum 20 pieces of software in there um, and almost anything you can get in other places as well. So it, it has not gained much traction yet in the in the official statistics community. So that's that's one sort of has been sort of a, a top down uh, initiative. There's a bottom up initiative that was done by Olaf ten Bos and me. It is called the awesome official statistics dot org where we just have a list, it's quite close to the, let's say the, it's even simpler than the Julia registry. It's just a list of things that are there. And uh, the, the, the things that are on the list are open source, easy to download, uh, so you can immediately use them and free to use. Um, and probably we're going to have to need, you know, need a, for better collaboration, probably need some kind of intermediate or, or, or collaboration in, in there. Okay, so we have another question. Yes. R as R Studio and Python as a lot of idols to uh, to make your life easier. Does Julia as any idol too? Uh, um, uh, Julia has uh, its own uh, IDE, uh, Integrated Development Environment. Uh, um, well, actually, these are on the next uh, slide. So R has R, R Studio uh, in Python, uh, especially in data science. Uh, Jupyter is uh, Jupyter Lab is uh, very popular, um, and there is also an IDE specially for uh, Julia. I, I forget the name, but it has also things like uh, graphic debugging uh, in place. So there is one uh, actually. Okay, so the, we have a question about the awesome list. It, inclu it, it includes also Julia and Python routines. Uh, there is some Python there. Uh, there's also JavaScript. Uh, there's Java. Uh, a lot of it is R. I mean, we basically uh, if, if put on there what people... Um, uh, ah, I see that Olaf is also here. <laughs> um, so basically, if people uh, create something and think this would be nice to put on the awesome list, we just check it against the criteria, whether it's open source, uh, easy to download, if there is a stable version, and then it's uh, eligible to be, to, uh, be on the awesome list. So we don't exclude uh, any language in that sense. Um, but thus far, we have not received any uh, Julia, um, Julia packages. Okay, so we have, I think, one, some comments, uh, but also a question. Let's say I have a table that is 10, uh, I would say, millions uh, for, for 50. It is fine to work it with R. Is there any workaround in R for any large data sets other than reduce them on uh, the data source? Uh, yes, there is. Um, I would say, uh, I mean, this is uh, the question of when is data big? Right. What, what does it mean uh, to be big data? And uh, I think the most useful answer is data is big when it's uh, bigger than one third of your free run memory. Right. Because uh, the reason for that is if it becomes bigger, you have to significantly change your workflow. So typically in a data analysis, you read in your data set and then you want to maybe filter out uh, some, uh, some part of it, uh, plot that separately filter throughout another part, fit a model, compare a little bit. So you easily have like one and a half, two copies of your data in memory while you're playing with it interactively. So that's why it's a good idea to have three times the memory uh, with respect to the size of your data. So uh, if you ask about uh, this like 10 million times 50 um, data set, 10 million rows with 50 variables, I would say, um, the, the first and best option is to just take a bigger computer. And then within R, you can uh, just keep working with data frames. 
Uh, or if you need higher performance, you can start using data table, um, which, has, uh, which is, I think, the highest performing uh, tool out there for, uh, for, for reading, writing, and doing uh, things like uh, group-wise uh, uh, summarizations and, and things like that. Uh, so I don't see a, a problem with working with big data in, in R. In general, it, things become difficult when you have to keep data in the source like you asked already in your question. So that means you have to start using uh, different packages. You have to start reading things chunk-wise. You have to start connecting maybe to even to a Spark uh, cluster. Uh, all your scripts change. Right, so the easiest way to scale uh, is uh, big RAM. Yeah. And just to give you an example, at the moment, if you log into uh, Amazon uh, Web Services, you can just, if you, you know, you, you take out your credit card and you can rent a computer per minute or per hour that has two terabytes of RAM. Right? You just specify how much RAM you want, how much cores you want. So big RAM is one of those uh, terms that has partly replaced uh, big data in a way. Okay, so indeed we have some comments, but then last two questions. Let's see if we can answer them. Is Julia faster than R in executing code with many nested for loops? Nested uh, loops. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Very. R, yeah, R has a R has a JIT compiler nowadays, um, but not as advanced as Julia. And just by design, I think compilation in Julia. Uh, Julia has. Uh, I mean, R uses vectorization just like Pandas uh, in Python. So you offload, uh, so you, as a user, you don't write loops, but you write things in vectors, and then everything is handled in, in, in underlying C code. Uh, and the nice thing about Julia is it just, that it just compiles straight down to machine code, which makes it really fast. Yeah, so for nested for loops, it's faster than both Python and uh, R, I would say. And uh, and last question, if I want to develop a package for R, can I use tidyverse or pull, or will CRAN not allow it? Uh, uh, yes, well, uh, if you use tidyverse as a dependency, as an imports, I think this is frowned upon, because tidyverse as a package doesn't do anything. It just imports something like 20 other packages. So when you import another package, try to uh, be, uh, well, modesty is, is kind of the, the, the way to look at it. Uh, only import what you really need. Uh, because every time you import something, that means that if, for example, PER gets updated, they have, at CRON, they have to retest your package as well. So that's one reason. It's kind of politeness to, to the CRON uh, volunteers. Um, another thing is that, um, if your package is lightweight, in the sense that it has low uh, dependency count, you also don't have to watch out for changes in, in your dependencies. But in principle, there's no, the, no problem on, on depending on PER or DeepLayer or anything like that. I mean, there are many, many packages, hundreds of packages depending on DeepLayer, depending on McGritter. Um, so in principle, there's no problem. Okay, we have a last question, then I suggest to go on. In your opinion, which language for functional programming is the most suitable? For functional programming? Um, uh, I would say uh, my, uh, I have, of course, most experience with R. But for pure functional programming, I would say uh, Julia and R are, would be better than, uh, than Python. And it, it depends also a little bit what parts of functional uh, things like reflexivity, where you can manipulate the language itself, is really elegant, built in into Julia as well as into R. And in Python, you need to add on libraries to do things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's what, uh, yeah, so uh, Walter says that Lisp and C++, that's true. I mean, functional programming languages have, and especially Haskell, has become very influential in the design of other programming languages. So you see a lot of things like, um, uh, like um, uh, gated, uh, it's called gated, no, I forget the term, but a lot of like things that have been developed in Haskell that are slowly coming into all kinds of other languages. Uh, both R and Julia have looked at Scheme and Lisp 
as for inspiration in their development. They are sort of dialects of that. So they are functional from the core. Okay, thank you. So I suggest now to go on with the last part of the webinar and we can have more questions at the end. Yeah. So I see we are running a little bit over time. Uh, my apologies for that. So this came up in questions already. I'm going to talk mostly about working with data. And if you look at, um, I'm going to discuss only two interfaces here. Uh, for R, the most popular uh, by far uh, IDE or working environment is RStudio. And RStudio is, is really something, well, I would call it a data science workbench. You have a, a panel where you have your script, where you develop your code. There's a panel where the code is executed. This is your R console. And then there's a panel, for example, with graphical output and help files. So they separate really the code from the uh, from developing code with running the code and viewing the output. And there's also a viewer for uh, things like uh, data frames and uh, built-in. Um, so this is this is one flavor. Um, and a nice thing about uh, RStudio is that it, uh, it supports not only R, it also supports uh, syntax highlighting for Markdown, SQL, JavaScript, uh, YAML, uh, LaTeX. Um, and since um, not so very long, uh, it also supports a Python console via a package called Reticulate. So you can program Python in our studio just like you can do it in uh, in any other uh, Python IDE interactively. So that's that's actually uh, uh, it, the tool integrates uh, both worlds in a sense to an extent. Um, the most uh, popular environment for data scientists working with Python at the moment is uh, something called Jupyter. Jupyter stands for Julia Python R, JupyterLab. Um, this is a where, where uh, our studio kind of takes the workbench approach with the different panels. Uh, Jupyter is really a what's called a notebook approach. You write your code, and as you execute it, the results of the execution are sort of intermingled or interspersed between the code. So you read the code, you read the output, you read the code, you read the output. This is the, the default, uh, let's say, what you see when you see um, Jupyter, uh, a Jupyter notebook. Um, so in RStudio, this is separated. Uh, RStudio also has notebooks. Um, RStudio server actually also supports Jupyter Lab, so the tools actually integrate. Uh, but these are two different flavors of working. Now, my personal favorite way of working is working with RStudio or just with a, with a clean editor that, that's not an IDE. Um, but many, many people who work interactively with data uh, prefer the notebook uh, interface. Um, to a very large extent, it's just a matter of flavor. Uh, the only thing I do want to note is that uh, notebooks have a have a state. So that means, uh, for example, I, what I could do, if, if I see this notebook here, I could edit the code over here in the top, not execute it, and then what I see over here uh, may not correspond to the code you see here, unless I execute everything again. So that's one uh, sort of, um, I would say, disadvantage of a notebook. Um, but if you can uh, live with that, and many people do so happily, uh, that's absolutely no problem, but it's just a small thing to be aware of uh, when you use these kind of tools. Okay. So in the last, uh, or the, this second part of this uh, part, let's look at some functionality when it comes to data analysis. Here is some um, uh, code in R, Python, and Julia to do a linear model. So I will um, predict or estimate the sepal length as a function of sepal width using a simple linear regression. And again, you see in R that uh, you read the data and then to create a model, to, to train the model, you can really just specify what you want to do. There's no real programming involved. You just say sepal length. I have a linear model. Um, sepal length is what I predict. Sepal width is what my uh, predictor is. And here you can find the training data. Um, if you look in, um, in Pandas or in Python, you have to uh, import a few libraries because Python is a general programming language. Um, we read the data into a Pandas data frame. 
uh, using uh, the CSV reader. But then in order to do a linear regression, we have to do a, a sort of a small step in between. Uh, you take the Iris data set, you select the column that you want, but the, the linear regression fitter doesn't understand uh, data frame columns from Pandas, right? The, the data, the, the fitting routine comes from one package, scikit-learn, and, Panda, and the data frame comes from another package called Pandas. So what I have to do is I take the, the column from the Iris data set, CPL length, I take its values, I have to reshape it, and then I pass it to the fitting routine. And the same with the, with the predictor. So there's a little bit of extra syntax here, and I uh, immediately will admit you can do this a little bit easier if you also load, for example, the Patsy package in, um, in uh, Python uh, before uh, the, the Python data scientists um, uh, start screaming at me. But uh, uh, the thing is that there, the integration between scikit-learn and, for example, Pandas is not as strong as uh, everything is within uh, native R. Um, and so this, this, this pops up on a, on a user level uh, at, at occasion. So you, you, have, you need a little bit more technical, detailed knowledge about what's happening in between in the terms of data structures that the different, um, the different libraries use to be able to use them together. Um, the same is in principle true for Julia, uh, except that uh, in this specific example, things work nicely together. I need three libraries, the data frames library, the CSV library to read CSV and uh, GLM library for linear model fitting. I read in the file and there's a function called LM and this is clearly modeled after how, um, how R works. There's a function called LM. You give it this same kind of specification, the predicted and the predictor variable and the training data and the model is created. Right. So, um, Basically, we have linear regression in, uh, in, in all three languages. Uh, and that's just a bit of difference in flavor and how you implement them. So it's worthwhile to have a look in what's available in, uh, in all languages. So I did a very rough uh, scan of uh, these different types of, of models. Are they available in R, Python, and Julia? And basically, you can say everything is available everywhere. Um, you can do a GLM, a generalized linear regression in Julia, in Python, and R, uh, elastic net, and regularized regression, CART, and, you know, machine learning. Almost everything is available everywhere. Uh, I would say that uh, when it comes to deep learning, well, Python is famously the tool to go to at the moment. Uh, there is something in Julia, although the initiatives there seem to be, uh, have to be not very actively maintained as far as I could uh, see it. Um, R, as far as I know, there's no native uh, library or package, but R does interface very well with Python, so you could do it like that. And the same is true for Julia. So if you want to use everything Julia, you could use the, the, the Python deep learning as well. Um, so when it comes to functionality, um, the availability of functionality, it's quite uh, comparable in that sense. Uh, there is, however, a big difference when you look at what I, what I call task-based packages. So uh, you, here you see, I'm on slide 24, by the way, sorry for not mentioning this earlier. Um, here you see uh, some tasks that are very common in official statistics, like complex sampling, disclosure control, small area estimation, imputation, time series, seasonal adjustment, ARIMA. Um, when you look at R, um, there are, there's a whole web page devoted to complex sampling and weighting um, in R. Uh, famously, there is the, the survey package by one of the R core developers uh, uh, that, where you can do all kind of complex uh, um, uh, non-equal uh, probability sampling and, and things like that. And also weighting, also weighting when there is non-response, unit non-response um, or item non-response. There are several packages focusing on disclosure control, which is really something, a big theme in official statistics. Um, but there's just no package in Python or Julia that can do that, right? That doesn't mean you cannot do it in Python. I mean, uh, for example, if you want to do disclosure control for tables, for tabular data, 
in the end, you're basically solving uh, a mixed integer kind of uh, uh, programming optimization problem, right? So uh, these optimization routines are, of course, available in Python or Julia. Uh, what these packages do, it makes it really convenient for you to define a disclosure control problem and then handle everything else. So kind of the application on the application side are, uh, and especially in official statistics, I think at the moment are has, uh, has an advantage over Python and Julia. Uh, similarly with imputation, this is a big thing in data analysis, uh, not so big in the Python and Julia world. I mean, there are more than a hundred imputation packages in R. I'm not saying that they're all uh, of the same quality, but basically any imputation method in literature, you will probably uh, find it in R, and there's a smaller chance you find in Julia. I know that in Python, um, is, I think in Scikit-Learn, there there is some imputation, um, more advanced imputation uh, functionality available. And in Julia, as far as I could find, there's only some hot deck methods. Okay, and then there's a, some, something similar going on for time series and seasonal, seasonal adjustment. So here you, you see also the the difference between the sort of um, the, the the purpose of the different languages. R is a data analysis tool uh, by design, and that means if you want to create an imputation package, you can already lean on a general linear regression uh, function that's already built into R. Uh, if you want to do something like that in Python, you first have to uh, lean on Stats models. Um, to do that. So to, to build these kind of applications on top of ours probably uh, in that sense a bit feels maybe more natural. And of course it's also statisticians that have this interest and, and, and R has been a statisticians tool from, from the beginning. Okay, so these are our differences, but if you look at the, the three languages, there are some interesting commonalities as well. All these languages have some kind of way of implementing data frames. All of them have this, uh, what's called formula data interface. Remember where I specified the shape of the form of the model, that sepal.length was predicted by sepal.width, with this uh, tilde in between. Um, I haven't discussed it, but all of them have an implementation of grammar of graphics, where you don't program a plot, but you just specify this variable will be x-axis, that variable will be y-axis, and the third variable will specify color. Um, and similarly, all of them have kind of a, a grammar or syntax for data manipulation and grouped summarization. Um, and if, if you dig a little bit deeper into this, it's interesting to see that this is actually, these things have been defined language independently. So I'm going to go a little bit into a history uh, for two slides. I'm on slide 26 now. Uh, this formula notation for models, for example, here's a, a linear uh, model specified uh, with a, just as a math equation. So I'm a methodologist, so I need to have one equation, uh, at least in one slide, um, with uh, one interaction effect and two uh, main effects. And this is how you would do this in, in, uh, in this uh, formula. Uh, we're interested to, to hear that this formula notation was actually invented even before S. It was defined uh, by Wilkinson and Rogers in 1973 already. And um, so it has become popular because of S and the popularity of R, as far as I can tell. Um, but the, the, the developments themselves, uh, the, the ideas are, are much uh, earlier. And the similar, similarly for the grammar of graphics, this was developed actually by Wilkinson while he was working for SPSS. Uh, that's a different Wilkinson actually than the Wilkinson from the previous slide. Um, but this has been uh, implemented into R, uh, famously by Hadley Wickham, where it became uh, very popular uh, quite quickly, um, which I think was a great, uh, helped a great deal in popularizing Wilkinson's work. But the original work again is, uh, much, uh, is much earlier. And then there are Python and Julia uh, implementations of these ideas as well. So I come to some conclusions and then I'll do a little, try to look forward uh, a little bit. Um, so there are uh, technical differences between the languages. Um, but if you look at the data analysis toolkits that all of these languages offer, uh, 
if I look at the language plus their libraries, these data analysis tools, to an extent, they, they roughly converge to a similar interface. I mean, they all offer something like grammar of graphics. They all offer something like the, this formula data interface. They all offer something like um, a grammar of data manipulation, which you ultimately can trace back to something that comes from uh, uh, development of SQL and databases. Uh, uh, for example, yeah, if you look in R in DeepLayer, that's really the IDs really can't date, go, go back to, to SQL. They have table in, table out, uh, this sort of consistency of types. Um, so it's interesting to see that these IDs um, uh, sort of persist across languages. Uh, that also means if you learn these IDs once, you can probably reuse them in, uh, in, in many occasions. Uh, comparing uh, the tools, I must say that uh, looking at all these tools again in the in the recent uh, while I was developing this uh, uh, this webinar, you really see that integration within data analysis tools is by far best in R. And this is not a surprise. I mean, R is designed for data analysis. Um, but it's not just the fact that 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 a linear model uh, is there and that data frames are already built into R. It's also the dependency management and, and shared data structure across all the 15,000 packages that make it really uh, easy to work with all these different packages together. Uh, when it comes to official statistics, R at the moment just has the most advanced uh, functionality. That's, that's just without any uh, uh, doubt. And the highest level of quality, cont quality control and extension packages. That's what I, I showed in the second part uh, of the talk. Um, okay, so Python has going uh, two things I would say for it. Uh, one is uh, it, when it comes to data analysis, it has the strongest in, uh, in machine learning and deep learning. Um, I would say by far, I mean, development there is just uh, astonishing. And another thing is, of course, that whereas in R uh, naturally integrates all data analysis tools, Python is so broadly used, it very naturally integrates with anything else. Right. If you want to combine Python with something like, I don't know, multimedia applications, it's just it's just possible in Python because there's so much uh, there are so much uh, libraries there. Um, of course, uh, and then you can do everything within Python within that uh, one language. Um, finally, Julia. I mean, I must say I, I love the design of Julia. I mean, they really have uh, taken time to. Uh, to use the best of all worlds, take inspiration from R. Uh, they have it's a functional programming language. They have a really beautiful type system. It compiles down straight to machine code. Um, they have a very fast, very nice interactive uh, REPL uh, as well. The debugging uh, things like uh, logging are you know because you start if you start again, you can learn from everybody's mistakes and in a very uh, uh, skilled way. So I must say this is a, uh, like I said, if I would start uh, again, uh, I would probably uh, go for Julia. But the thing is that Julia doesn't, just doesn't have this whole uh, as large community as R and Python uh, yet. So uh, it's newer, um, that has advantages of being technically a super and the disadvantage is that it just doesn't have the widen, wideness of adoption that Python and R have uh, at the moment. Um, finally, I will try to look a little bit into the future. Um, what I see is that all these tools are, are, are integrating. I mean, it's already possible if you run Python to call, uh, if you also have Julia installed, to run Julia code straight from Python. You can also call py, uh, run Python code from Julia. You, it will just start up a Python instance, run the code, and return uh, the data to Julia. Okay. Uh, the same goes between R and Python and Julia and R. Uh, the thing is, at the moment, this integration is very, very rough. Um, I would say. I mean, if I call Julia code from R, what happens is data gets exported from out of R, imported into Julia. Julia will run. The results are exported and read into R. So these three programming languages are not um, operating on the same data structure. They just use copies. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is what we already saw is that 
R Studio is now supporting Python and Jupyter uh, supports R, Python and Julia out of the box. And uh, for example, in R Studio, if you create a markdown reports, you can just have a code chunk in Julia, the next or in R, the next one in Python, and then one in, in SQL, and all the results will just be integrated into one uh, report. Uh, so you, what I've seen in the last two, three years is a closer and closer integration. And one thing to uh, keep an eye on, that's an interesting project at the moment, is called Ursa Labs. That's uh, uh, a company or an institute um, that is uh, started by Wes McKinney, uh, the person that uh, developed Pandas. And what they're trying to do is to create one uh, representation of a sort of, uh, well, data frame, for example, that you load in once and then you can program against that from both Python and R. At the moment, there's no Julia integration yet. Uh, it's supported by quite a, a number of big in industry uh, players, uh, but it's also quite new. So this is just something to watch, uh, but that would mean an even closer integration of R and Python. So I think in the future, people will just use uh, uh, the best. I don't think there will be one very big clear winner, um, at least in the near future, it seems that the tools will integrate what's best for a specific task. So um, this was my last slide. Um, I'm happy to take uh, uh, more questions. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Indeed, we have a lot of uh, already a couple of questions. So yeah, we are. A little long, but it's because we had a lot of questions. So I think our um, participants are really interested. So we have uh, Walter is saying, okay, Julia is the only language of the three that is fully written in Julia itself. Isn't Adley Wickman also involved in Ursa Labs? Uh, yeah, both are true, yeah. Julia is uh, self-hosted, uh, that's a term for it. So uh, almost all of Julia is written uh, purely in Julia. Yeah, that's true. And uh, indeed, Henley Wickham is uh, is um, formally an advisor to uh, Ursa Lab. So Wes McKinney is sort of the, the CEO, or I'm not sure if it's called CEO, but he runs the, uh, the business. Our studio uh, supports it uh, financially, amongst other things. And Hadley is one of the people uh, advising. Yeah. And then we have a question, what's the base way to start using Python for this analysis? For example, reading book about it, so you think participating to online courses? Uh... Uh, uh, practice, 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 I would say. Uh, and I mean, you can read books. I think nowadays people really prefer to do the, I mean, you can just, uh, it depends a bit what your motivation is when you are learning. If you want to go quickly into applications, like you want to do a, a linear regression into, in, in Python, for example, then I would just Google linear regression with Python and for sure hit one, two, and three are tutorials to do that, All right? So then you can just do the sort of task-based uh, learning and then one by one application by application, you learn it. Um, that's that's for people that are really motivated by uh, by their uh, let's say immediate applications. There's, there's a huge amount of material online. Um, if you want to do it sort of more fundamentally, I think you could do an online course. There there is the data science with Python by Wes McKinney, but that has been that's a bit dated, I would say by now. Uh, it was written published uh, maybe almost 10 years ago now, and the status of Python in machine learning and data science now has advanced a huge amount since that book came out. Uh, but then you can sort of like start at the beginning and, and work through it. So it depends a bit what type of uh, learner you are, I would say. Okay, so now we have another more specific question. In what case it is useful to use C++ in combination with R? Ah. Um, well, you can use uh, either C or C++ with R and, and even Fortran. Uh, that's how it's designed. I mean, John Chambers, the, one of the inventors of S, always says it's an interface language. Um, I would say uh, only when performance is critical and you cannot do it uh, by vectorizing your code. 
Um, so I have written several packages where I, I did all the, the core algorithms in C because I would have to create, uh, there was no way to avoid looping in R, for example, and then uh, it would be, uh, and then, then it has really benefits to do it in C. Yeah, but you have to be careful. I mean, when you do C, you get all the power of memory allocation pointers and, uh, and things like that. So you have to know a little bit what, you, uh, what you're what you doing. Um, if you start using, uh, want to uh, use compiled code with R, it's probably the easiest way to start is to start with C++ because there's the RCPP, which generates a lot of the boilerplate uh, for you. Um, and then it's actually really easy to, uh, then RStudio also supports that. So that's the easiest way to start, I would say. Okay, so we had uh, some suggestions. Then do you have uh, advice on how to keep track on both R and Python? I learn both, but usually only need one at a time, and then it's very difficult to get back into the other language. Yes, I, I know what you mean. Uh, if I don't use Python for a while, I also uh, or C, even I have to. Uh, takes me a day to uh, get uh, back into my muscle memory. Yeah, I follow. I mean, to just keep up to date with what's happening. Uh, Twitter is really one social medium where a lot of the data science um, uh, discussion happens, and a lot of announcements are made. So you can follow some of those. Uh, like the, the like the, the famous uh, data science programmers for new announcements. That's at least to keep up to date with what's happening. Um, so there's Twitter. There's of course you know rbloggers.com that uh, you can uh, see you know what people write. Uh, people write uh, blog posts and what they do with R. I, I, I visit that once in a while. I used to visit it almost every day when I was learning. Python, yeah, there's something like towardsdatascience.com where you have blogs that are often Python related. So there are online resources to uh, social media and, and, and blog uh, uh, gathering uh, websites that, uh, that are pretty nice to keep at least a little bit up to date. And other than that, yeah, it's just getting back by, by, by practicing again, I think. This is Dario. <laughs> so we had <laughs> uh, another question. You, and then I think we, we need to close, but la last question. Do, uh, so when do you think or do you happen to know something about if, when we will see the merging of Tibbles and Pandas? Uh, I don't think this will merge. I mean, Pandas is really will stay inside Python. Um, I mean, uh, but, well, maybe one funny comment is that what you see is that both in uh, Python and Julia, uh, you know, have been copying R when it comes to data frames, right? And, and R, of course, it comes from S, and maybe even before that. Uh, but the, the, the term data frame, as far as I know, comes from S. Uh, so it's funny to see how uh, when Wes McKinney started to develop Pandas, he was really thinking about there's nothing like base R in, in Python. So we started building these data frames, which are central to R, with all the methods that feel like you're using uh, base R. Uh, it has been moving towards uh, closer towards uh, what what the tidyverse uh, is doing as well. Uh, I would say so. It's sort of half half, half tidyverse, half base R kind of uh, feel. Uh, but integration, I think the integration, uh, if it ever fully happens, would be the the, the project by. Ursa Labs, and then probably you would not use a data frame or a Pandas data frame, but something else that you can use both in Python and in in R. Um, that's hard for me to tell. I haven't experimented with it, uh, to, to be honest. I know there's something around, but uh, I have not experimented with that yet. Oh yeah, and the slowdown in Pandas. I don't know, that might have something to do with Wes McKinney being more busy with, uh, more involved with Ursa Labs than with Pandas at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure. That's a wild guess. Yeah, and, and then, uh, uh, I'm not sure, I didn't hear, you, did you already read the one, have you heard about R Studio Cloud? Ah. And what do you think of it? Uh, I haven't tried it myself. I hear uh, good, um, 
uh, news about. I mean, people I have talked to that used it uh, are happy with it. Of course, when you do things in the cloud, you have to think also about where is my data? Is it secure? Is it allowed to cross borders and, and things like that? Uh, we have an RStudio Pro installation uh, in our office, and we have good experiences, good experiences with that as well. Um, so all in all, I think RStudio is a really, really user-focused, user-friendly tool. Um, so I, I can't speak from my own experience, but what I hear from people is that they are very satisfied with it. Okay, so I think we have no more questions. So thank you, Mark, really, for this insightful uh, talk, uh, for your participation, replying to the questions. And of course, thank to all uh, of our participants who join us for today from many different places. Uh, you can already download the presentation from the EMOS 2020 events website, where the recording of the webinar will be also available as soon as possible. And on the same website, you can also find the recording of the first, uh, first four webinars of the program. In the meantime, I can ask you to check the inbox of the email account you use for registering to the webinar, uh, as you have already received the link to a short survey about today's webinar. We really appreciate your feedback for further improve our webinars. The next webinar is scheduled on Tuesday, the 7th of April, but Edwin De Donge from Statistics Nedersa will be presenting on communicating uncertainty in official statistics. Please note that due to the current emergency situation in Italy, the webinar on demographic change and official statistics, originally scheduled for next Tuesday, has been rescheduled on Wednesday, the 15th of April at uh, 16. Uh, registration to the webinar will still be valid for the new date, and of course, new registration will be allowed until the day before the webinar. So we hope that you will be join also at our next webinars. So thank you again to Mark. Thank you to everybody uh, for now, and have a nice evening, and take care of yourself. Bye-bye.